Ja, welkom terug, hier is ingeskakel by Heartbeat FM 103.9 en 107.4, ek sê die uitsoring, luister ons is ook ingeskakel, en ons het natuurlijk daarna die klanke van Rita geluister, Rita Springer, dit is nou nie Jerry Springer sy, sy uh, sister die ma, uh, weet maar wie is Jerry Springer? Ek weet, so <laughs> ja, nee, dis, en dit is my prachtige song, jy weet, ek het om die eerste keer gehoor, en uh, die song is I Call You Father, jy weet, en, en, um, Ek dink dit is seker die kostbaarse ding in my leven. The most precious thing in my life is to be able to call him father. And this morning I just want to carry on with finding God. And uh, we want to just talk about episode 8. And uh, yesterday we, we, we spoke about uh, um, a bit of a, I would say almost controversial topic, which is losing my religion. And it's not the song... The, I think there's a 90s song or 80s song that, that's losing my religion, but this was talking about moving from religion to intimacy with God. And um, like I said, last week we spoke about uh, spiritual power and we spoke about the effect that that had in my life growing up as a young boy uh, living in a house where there was manifestations of spiritual power, not necessarily God's power, but um, mostly evil spiritual power. And uh, this morning, as I woke up, I was reminded of something that happened to me when I was a young boy. And that's why I want to take you back a bit. I'm going to just read a portion of the book here, and then we'll, we'll enter into uh, some discussion about these topics. Um, welcome to the Facebook Live audience. I see there are some people online, and I know that we've got hundreds of people actually viewing it uh, afterwards, uh, actually thousands of people viewing it afterwards. So if you um, feel like it, you can spread the word. Um, some of these sessions that we do in these episodes are, are very good for evangelism so you can always just uh, pass it on to somebody and let them listen to it and then they can decide for themselves what they want to do so what i say is welcome back to finding god i hope you're still enjoying my stories <laughs> well i've had some feedback about that and it seems that some people are enjoying it i must say that i in, that i truly enjoy writing them as I mentioned, for many years I've been trying to record some of my life events, but it always felt like I lost inspiration along the way. Uh, for some other reason, at this stage, every single morning I wake up, I have a specific truth that God wants to share. I'm sure you will never guess which past memory triggered this episode. So let me tell you. Well, let me not keep you in suspense any longer. Today I want to take you back to 1978. 1978. Now many of you might not have been born. <laughs> Master says she was born. But um, I was six years old. And as a family we didn't do much together. Um, we weren't a happy family. As I've said before, there was alcohol abuse in our household. And uh, at that stage it was me and my brother, Eddie. Uh, uh, some people call him Teddy. And uh, we went on a Cape Town trip. Uh, and, and this is one of my fondest memories because we went down to Cape Town and we visited what I would like to call my rich grandfather. That was my, my mother's father. I can st still remember eating my first toasted cheese. And I remember Omar Ray, uh, his wife, bought one toasted cheese sandwich and she shared it uh, in half. And we, have, we were in the Golden Acre under the street and for me as a child it was so uh, profound that we could actually be under the street and then I ate that toasted cheese sandwich and that 
because we didn't, as children, we didn't grow up rich and wealthy, so we didn't have a lot of takeaways and stuff like that. So that toasted cheese sandwich for me tasted like the best thing I had ever tasted, and I was so excited about that. And um, and also being under the street, that was for me like I couldn't believe that you could actually walk under the street. I mean, it was it was a big deal when that Golden Acre was built in Cape Town, and and in 1978 I was there. And we enjoyed that. And I also remember um, the luxury of, of their mansion. Well, it looked to me like a mansion because it was a big double story house. We grew up in a, in a little house here for the first portion of my life that was actually later. They built this building on top of that house where we are broadcasting today. This was actually my backyard. I'm sitting now in my, in my no, this is not, yeah, this was my backyard. So I'm sitting in my backyard yard here where my grandmother actually um, used to keep her, uh, not keep her, but, but she hid a, a man working in the garden during apartheid. And she used to hid him in her house uh, because um, he grew up with us and she really loved him. And he was not allowed to be in town. And she hid him right here in this premises. And that's also one of the, one of the, uh, uh, I could say, you know, the, the, the bad images or bad influences of my liver. Because he actually, Willem used to go and, uh, buy, when I was very young and I couldn't uh, go buy drugs, Willem used to go actually buy my drugs for me on his bicycle. So, so she hit the wrong man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but Willem was a goeie ousiel. And um, so we grew up right here and, and so we weren't rich. And um, here in Cape Town I was in this double story house uh, over, overlooking the beautiful city of Cape Town. Uh, the nostalgic mountain, table mountain, and all of that. It was just overwhelming for a six-year-old. And then one of, the, one of the greatest things happened to me. For the first time I can remember, we went to go see a movie. And the first movie we watched was Superman 1. Uh, still with, uh, uh, with Reeves, uh, Christopher Reeves in it. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost 50. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm moving towards 50. And I can still remember that movie. And um, I left that movie energized. Uh, a man with such power that could fly, that was so strong he could throw around uh, cars and big items like they were paperweights. Fire came from his eyes, you know. It, it was just sort of, for me, it was, it was overwhelming to see so much power in one individual. And you can, you can possibly guess that as we left there, I had this dream of, of becoming Superman. I think the dream that many boys and girls have of being a superhero. And I remember myself and my, my brother, we went up to the balcony. We were standing on top of the balcony and, and looking out over the city. And I was having an internal conversation with myself that I would now ask God to make me Superman. And I, I still remember as a child, with a childlike faith, I, I actually asked God, I said, God, um, if you make me Superman, if you give me that power, I will use it responsibly. And uh, I remember that I actually, I started lifting my little heels off the, <laughs> off the floor. And uh, I write in the book here yeah, that it was in my mind to actually jump off the balcony. But I don't think I had the faith and the guts for that and just test God, you know, and see if I would just like take off flying. But luckily I didn't because else I might have not been here to tell you this story or I might have been doing this from a wheelchair if, if I jumped off that balcony that, that faithful day. But what happened is I had this great desire for power. And I can, I can remember the disappointment that I felt when I did not receive that power, when I wasn't Superman. So if you were ever wondering... I'm not Superman. <laughs> I know he's somebody else, but I'm not Superman. I'm, I'm just a, a child of God. But I was very disappointed not being a, sup, a, a superhero. And in, in episode three, I spoke about, um, you know, the dark side of the spiritual power. And I remember also uh, just a while after that, having a conversation with my mom uh, one evening because I, I wanted power. I wanted that power and I think that desire for power is, is sort of in all of us because we are spiritual beings. We, 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 um, we crave that power. We, we crave that relationship with the Lord. It's, it's a natural desire because we are a spirit. We live in a body and we have a soul. So, so wanting spiritual power is natural. But um, I, I had a discussion with my mother and I can't remember the exact um, conversation we had. But I remember returning to my room 
and trying to move objects with my eyes, you know, looking at stuff and uh, I think it's called ESP or something, but uh, or something like that, but, but looking at stuff and trying to move it with my eyes. But I seriously also felt that tapping into the dark forces would not be uh, advisable. I sort of, um, you can say, almost uh, instinctively knew that uh, I would have to pay some kind of price if I tapped into those forces. I knew that the, the things I was experiencing in my house, they were real. I, I knew that um, there were definitely some things at work. But I knew that if I, if I tapped into that, I just as a child even, I knew if I tapped into that, I knew that it would come with consequences. Because of the fact that I felt this great fear always upon my life, and I could feel when things were moving in the house, when spiritual forces were at work, I could sense that there was fear. And, um, and that sort of gave me a red flag saying, look, I'm not going to get involved in demonic stuff. I'm not going to dabble in, a, in occultic practices. And uh, what I write here in the, in the book is, is that we actually along the road in, in the church, uh, we've, we've met some people. Uh, and, and, and the one person I mentioned in the book um, is, is a young person that you would never have thought that this person would be open to demonic possession. But um, this person was with us in the church and, and, and a beautiful person and an upstanding member of the community's um, a, a family member. And one day, to our surprise, when the anointing was working, this person started manifesting with a demon. And I remember my surprise. I, I thought to myself, how can this beautiful person never drugs, never use drugs, never, uh, never hung out in the, in the wrong circles? Um, how could this people, this specific person be demon possessed? It, it really bothered me. And then after I had a conversation with the person, I determined what the problem was. This desire for power uh, was working in a lot of the children that, that are in school in, in, in one of our local high schools here. And a lot of those people started dabbling in the occult. They started dabbling in occultic practices. And what happened was, whilst this person was actually dabbling, and I'm not sure exactly what, what it was, if it was a seance or some kind of a thing, a demon actually entered into that person. And that demon gave this person extreme depression, uh, this person cut themselves. This person had lots of suicidal thoughts. And um, the only way this demon actually manifested was when the presence of God was moving. And I, I, will, get to, I will get to that a bit later. But the fact of the matter is um, uh, that if you have a desire for power, it's natural. Uh, we all have that desire. But what happens is the enemy provides us counterfeit power. And what it does is that counterfeit power, if it's Wicca, if it's witchcraft, if it's, if it's, a, a, if it's spiritualism, if it's, if it's uh, calling up spirits and, 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 and all sorts of things. I mean, there's a lot of these occultic practices. They open doors for demonic possession. And that is what the devil wants to do. He wants to kill, steal and destroy and control people's lives. And um, I, I have a chapter here and my first rodeo. And... Um, I will never forget after I became a Christian, that day I prayed here in 57 Victoria Street, just one block away. What I felt was I felt the anointing of the Holy Spirit for the first time in my life. And it was such a joy. It was such a peace. I was ecstatic. I, I burst out. And, and, and if Anton and Nikki were still alive today, you could ask them. But I, I, when, when I said that prayer and David said, Amen, I turned to both of those guys and I said to them, Guys, do you feel this? Do you feel this power? Do you feel this anointing? Do you feel this joy? It felt for the first time that um, the things that were on my life, uh, the negativity, the, 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 um, the depression, the fear, it felt like all of a sudden that lifted off my life. And it just felt like I was, I was delivered out of prison. Now, I might have, I mean, I might have had an evil spirit. I don't know, and many, many people have asked me with my mom's um, occultic practices and stuff in the house I grew up in, did I ever go for deliverance? Did I ever break uh, generational curses? I can't answer those things because when I prayed that prayer, I could just feel that I was free. And a second prayer took place at Pastor Kubis's house where some of the church members, I don't know if Master will probably remember, 
Some of the church prim members were there when David um, uh, dropped me, Nikki and Anton all off there and they prayed for me. And when they prayed for me, I felt that power again come upon me. And I spontaneously with one hand took a, a Bob Marley badge and I, I ripped it off my jean jacket with one rip. And then all the beads and all the stuff. It was as if the Holy Spirit just said to me, get rid of this stuff. The Bob Marley uh, emblems, the, 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 the rasta color beads. I just got rid of all those things and, and I started experiencing God's presence, God's power. But at that stage, obviously, I was just a baby Christian and I still had to sit under the word in Pastor Kubis' ministry. Master was there and Engela was discipling me and Teresa was there and Johan was there and they were all in the family and everybody helped me and assisted me. But I was still a baby Christian. But then I went to, to my mother's house one day and uh, Pastor Kubis was Pastor Kubis was preaching in the church about um, divine health and divine healing and about normal believers like you and me praying for others. And what happened was I, I my mother said to me she, that she had an extreme headache. And uh, I, I thought to myself, well, let, my, let me put what I've learned into practice. So I asked her, I said, Mom, can I pray for you? And, um, you, you know, uh, a while before that, two gentlemen, and I, I won't mention their names, but two gentlemen from a church here in George went to my mom's house. They heard that she was involved in, in, in witchcraft and she was actually sort of known as a witch. Now, a lot of the, the rumors were extremely exaggerated, but these two guys went to her house and they, they knocked on the door. And when she opened the door, they rebuked her in the name of Jesus. And then they left. And we still had a laugh about that because for me, that was um, maybe not wise. And I, and I thought, you know, uh, why did they leave? Uh, you know, if, if they really wanted to rebuke the devil, why did they go again? But that day, um, I didn't laugh anymore because I asked my mom if I could pray for her. And she said to me that uh, I could pray. And as I started praying for this headache, uh, something started manifesting. And because I was a young Christian, I didn't exactly know what to do. She went flat on the ground and her body started moving in strange ways. And she started talking in a funny voice. And there was no church service. There was no elders and deacons and pastors and nobody to help me. I was just like standing at the door ready to bolt because I didn't know. Uh, I had an idea what was going on, but I didn't know how to handle that situation. So uh, I remember the devil turning to me and, and, and the devil saying to me that um, I'm an old one or something or an old woman and you won't be able to get me out. And I remember that when the devil said that to me, I actually felt to myself that uh, I, I, I agree. I won't be able to get this devil out. And I actually just wanted to remove myself from that situation. And that is what I, I call my first rodeo with the devil, uh, which I obviously lost, but I learned some lessons there. And what happened was, uh, I, I write here in the book, I says, this experience highlighted the great necessity of power. In the believer's life. So all of a sudden I realized that being a Christian wasn't just a title. It wasn't just attending a service. It wasn't just sitting there. But what I realized is that there were people, beautiful people, that um, had somehow gotten trapped in the circle of evil. Somehow, uh, and, and I mean you might even know such people in your life, people that have patterns in their lives that, that continue uh, with certain things that they, they never stop. And how many people have I seen in my short life that have actually died because of those patterns? They've never been able to actually get free from that devil. And leaving my mother there and, and walking away there, I could some, almost identify with the disciples when uh, Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. The disciples were below, some of them were below those that stayed, and they were trying to desperately drive this devil out of this child. Uh, and this child was in a terrible state. This child would actually not be functional. He would, um, he would actually throw himself in the fire. He would hurt himself. And his father was desperate to get him free. And that is one thing about power. As the church of Jesus Christ, we need the power. It's not, it's not a nice to have. It's a necessity because uh, what I learned from Pastor Kovis over the years was that he, he operates in the ministry of deliverance. So th through uh, the, the 20 plus years 
the, the ministry of deliverance has, has been happening right in front of my eyes. People have come in um, with uh, certain personalities, with certain trends, with, with certain oppressive spirits and possessive spirits, and they have left the, they have left the ministry totally free, totally delivered. Uh, many of them actually coming back months later again demon possessed and worse because the Bible says that if somebody gets possessed um, and they get delivered then that devil goes around and runs errands and then comes back and brings a few bodies with. So the condition of the person is actually worse if they don't uh, remain standing in God's word and, and, and remain faithful in their Christian faith and they turn back to the occultic practices again. So I wanted to put that in the book that that is sort of the first section that I wanted to share. And, and what I'm trying to stress in this se section is, yes, we have a natural desire for power. And number two, that natural desire for power uh, is used by the enemy to corrupt. And number three is that um, we, as the church of Jesus Christ, we need that power. So I'm going to just give over to Master to say a few things because I don't want to dominate the conversation. Um, and next I'll talk about the Holy Spirit power and my experience in my life. It's still part of the same episode, but I want to just uh, say, ask Master if she has any information on this. Hey Richard, I have listened, but I see and I can tell you why I find it good. I find it good. I don't know why I find it good. But I can tell you why I find it good. I can tell you why I find it good. Yes. But I find it good. I can tell you why I find it good. And I find it good. I find it good. Wat jij van praat uh, is waar en ik kan identificeren daarmee. Uh, want ons het die pad samen met jou geloop en uh, ons komen lang pad saam, jy weet. Maar uh, vir ochend toe ek uh, vir die Heere vraag, want ons het nou gister aand moest nou gepraat, ons sal maar oor ene, ons sal maar gaan soos die Heilige Geest vir ons lijf vermoorde. En uh, toe het jy nou vir ochend uh, gesê, dat jy weet hierdie van die Heere yes. ontvang vir ochend. En uh, snaaks genoeg, dit wat ek ontvang het, uh, pas mooi in by dit. Sure. Jy weet, dit is daarom al awesome hoe die heilige geest is. Sure. Hy is een geest van orde. Amen. Jy weet, hy het orde en hy sal nooit confusion. En uh, so wonderlik uh, dat die heilige geest vanmorgen met my begin deel weer eens wat, wat baie, baie kostbaar is vir my in my leven en en vir my en pastoor Kobus op hierdie pad waar langs ons kom, jy weet, is genade. Ja. Uh, die Engels klink baie mooi, grijs, grijs. <laughs> en jy weet, baie mense, as hulle genade hoor en hulle hoor grijs, dan denk hulle glory. Dit is die licence om te sondag. Ja. Dat is de license to sin. Yes. Because God is a God of grace and He has given us grace that we can just say, we, uh, we believe in Jesus, but we can live as we want to. Sure. Nee, we weet wat glad nie waar oor kruis gaan nie. Glad nie. Ons het genade ontvang, wonderlijke genade om gereed te word. Ons kan dit nie verdien nie. Ja. Nie een van ons het dit verdien om gereed te word nie. En dit wat Richard ook hier vertel, die genade van God het nou om toe uitgereid. Yes. En om gereed. En, en so het die genade van God na ons toe uitgereik en ons gereed en prijs God vir die wonderlijke genade. Maar weet jy wat sê die Heere vir my vanmorgen en terwijl ek nou so luister na hierdie getuienis van Richard en hierdie goed wat hy praat, toe denk ek, yes die Heere is daar maar awesome. Want hy sê vir my vanmorgen, hy sê vir my, Christ is the power that enable you. Sure. En as jy gaan terugdink, dan denk jy, dit is wonderlik, want weet jy, hoeveel keer het Paulus nie gepraat nie, en ek wil graag vir julle hierdie stikkie lees hier waar ek oopgemaak het, wat ek nie kyk hier so, is dit nou in 1 vers 4, of is dit nou 4 vers 1, wat ek nie gauw vinnig. Ja, maar in elk geval, ek, terwijl ek nou die skrif soek, wil ek nou nie stil blij nie, want ek het al gehoor, hulle sê stilte is die vijand van die radio. <laughs> en jy blij nie stil hier nie, as jy hier sit met jy praat. Maar prijs die Heere, jy weet, Paulus uh, uh, het nie die probleem gehad van die vijand wat hom aangeval het. 
en uh, baie mense het baie bespiegelinge oor wat het ja, was, wat die so. doering was in Paulusse vlees. Yes. En ons kan oor baie dinge praat wat hy, maar in elk geval hy het die doering gehad. Yes. En hy het drie keer vir die Heere gevraam dit van om al weg te vat. Nou ek meen ons vraag aanhoudend, Paul, vir Paulus was drie keer genoeg. Na drie keer het hy besef, uh, dit gaan nie gebeur nie. En God het vir hom gesê, my genade is vir jou genoeg, want in jou zwakheid ja. word my kracht volbring. Ja. En uh, terwijl ons hier praat van kracht, jy weet, elke kind van God wil graag krachtig wees vir, yes. vir God. Yes. En ons is krachtig, yes. al besef ons dit nie altyd nie. Want daar is een wonderlijke, voortreffelijke kracht in ons beleef. Maar is ons allemaal allemaal staat om die kracht te kan handel. Yeah. Jy weet, yeah. you must be able to handle the power. Yes. Uh, jy het die kracht. Jy het dit. Maar weet jy wanneer dit op sy sterkste is, is wanneer jy op jou zwakste is. Yes, amen. Die Heere sê uh, ook vir ons dat uh, God resists yes, the proud, amen. but he gives grace to the humble. Yes. Hy gee die genadekracht van hom, wanneer ons humble is. Yes. Wanneer ons niks word nie en hy word alles. Yes. En jy weet, dit is so wonderlik om te besef, dat Godse Heilige Gees werk in ons, om te wil sowel as om te doen, om ons by daai plek te bring, waar die kracht van God die grootste, dier ons ja. levens ten toon gestel kan word. En ons moet saam met hom werk, en ons self op die altaar sit elke dag, ja. dat die kracht van God, krachtig dier ons kan werk. Maar dit is nie eindelijk waar oor ek wou praat nie, die ding wat ek oor wou praat is, dat ons kry genade wanneer ons dit nodig het. En, en selfs hierdie, hierdie uh, ministry wat dier ons leven vloei, yes. is genade. Yes. Want, want Paulus sê in, in, in uh, Romeine 12, uh, This grace was given unto me. Amen. This grace, om hierdie vir julle te bring. Dit is die genade wat God vir my gegeet om dit vir julle te bring. En so gee hy vir elke een van ons genade op die oomlik. Die, die, die gift wat dier ons vloei is een gift van genade. Dit wat God in ons beleed is dier genade. Yes. Dit is dier genade dat ons vanmorgen kan minister dat hierdie dier vir ons oopgegaan het om hier op haar bied. Ja vir julle te kan minister en die woord te kan bring. Dit is genade. Dit is een genade dier wat God vir ons oopgemaak het. En ons kan nie bid dat elke een daar buiten wat luister, sy oore oop is, want, want Jesus het gesê, uh, vandag as jy my woord hoor, yes. verhaard nie jou hart nie. En, en hier sit ons, baie van ons elke dag, en vertel vir van die genade van God, yeah. wat dier yeah. ons leven vloei, en ek glo, daar is baie wat vanmorgen daar buiten luister, yes. wat kan praat, van genade, van genade wat dier hulle leven vloei, van genade wat hulle nie net gered het nie, yes. maar wat hulle elke dag dra, Amen. is dit nie wonderlik nie, en vooral in hierdie tyd wat ons nou in leven, wat daar is een verskrikkelike uitdaging, op die hele wereld is, Ons is nie uitgesluit as kinders van die Heere nie. Ons is gaan die selfde deur nou. Ons loop hierdie selde ding deur, hierdie, hierdie uh, verandering wat oor nagekom het. Maar weet jy wat? God gee vir ons genade as sy kinders om hier deur te kan gaan. Maar nie net om hier deur te kan gaan nie en nie net deur die dinge van ons leven te kan gaan nie. Maar om meer as oorwinnaars yes. daardier te kan gaan. Is dit nie wonderlik nie? En jy weet, uh, 
Dit is wat mij zo so blij maakt. Ik zeg nou die dag voor pas door Kobus. Jij weet, ons denkt niet meer nie. Na al die jaren, ons denkt niet meer nie. Ons staan niet elke ochtend op in prijs God voor zijn genade. Want ons weet niet hoe lief ons niet. Ons weet niet om, ons denkt niet eerst niet. Ons, ons weet niet hoe ook gaan ons dier niet. Ons, ons lei niet honger niet. Ons het een warm bed om, om, om op te slaap. Ons het een dag oor ons kop. Yes. Ons het zelfs een kar wat petrol in het om je te rui. Ek kan niet voor jou sê hoe nie. Ek probeer niet eerst voor jou sê hoe nie. Maar ik wil niet voor jou sê dat hierdie God geef vir ons genade. Hij sê, my genade is niet elke morgen. Groot is my getrouwheid. So ek kan God niet hier dier op hierdie radio golwe vir morgen prijs en loof vir sy genade. En ek dink dit is precies waar oor Pastor Richard vir morgen, waar oor hierdie hele boek gaan. Genade. En, en ek sê altyd, die, die lijn wat dier ons leven is, ek alle sê, moest daar is een rooie lijn in het touw. Ek weet nie wat die klimmers klim, ek het nou nog nooit geberg, ek het baie berge geklim, maar nie fysisch is nie. Maar in elk geval, alle sê, dit maak die touw sterk. So, yes. vertel my maar of het waar is en of het nie waar is nie, maar ek weet, daar is een genade touw dier ons leven gevlag. En dit is een geweldige sterk touw. Ons het al berge geklim. Ons het al rivierig dier geswem. Ons het al selfs die rooisee dier gestap. En ek kan net sê, die genade is waar oor alles gaan. Die genade, that power, that enables you yes. to go through it with unharmed, mm. victoriously. Sure. Jo, dit is wat my opgewonde gemaakt het vanmorgen toe die Heilige Geest dit net mm. weer eens in my wakker maak. Yes. Weet. En ek kan net sien hoe dit in een lijn loop yeah. dit wat vanmorgen ook hier gedeel word. Prijs die Heere. Well, if you've just tuned in, you're tuned to Heartbeat FM 103.9 and 107.4. Uh, you're tuned to the His Heart program, and uh, we are on every Friday. And we are talking about finding God. Uh, it's a book that I've been writing about my life, and I believe that the Holy Spirit's been inspiring me the past um, few days, actually, to really write. I've, I've been writing. I, I look here on Google Docs. Uh, it's over 40 A4 pages that I've been writing. So um, it's very, very exciting. And um, just before Master spoke, I, I was talking about um, my desire for power since I was a little boy. I was speaking about my, my request to God to become Superman, <laughs> which obviously didn't occur. And then I also spoke about uh, demonic manifestations and, and just uh, our natural desire for power. I spoke about uh, two specific experiences where I first of all experienced God's power. And now for me, um, in general speaking, the church was powerless because I grew up in, in, in the kind of church where there was no manifestation of the Spirit and everything was, was very traditional. So I didn't think that the church had any power or that any power was available for the church or in the church. And what I experienced at my conversion as a drug addict, um, praying, asking God to touch me, I could experience God touching my body. But more than just um, sort of healing my spirit or, or becoming born again, my physical body was actually touched. Uh, because when I went to rehab, um, they said to me that I had permanent uh, short-term memory problems because of drug addiction, uh, which God touched. Uh, my doctor said to me that I had permanent lung damage. And within a, a question of a few days, my lungs were sorted out. And then also years later, um, I, I struggled with, um, with a hip that was supposed to be replaced and God also touched that. So I experienced God's power in that dimension as well. But the next thing I just want to mention is the Holy Spirit's power and, um, I, um, and um, for power. We have a natural desire for power and uh, I desired uh, the Holy Spirit's power. I heard about this, Pastor Kubis was preaching about it, that the gift of the Spirit was available. I didn't know this beforehand. I, I did uh, notice once my, my um jockey praying in tongues. 
I didn't exactly know what it was, but uh, as Pastor Corpus was ministering about this, I thought I wanted it. So one night at Robin and Lydia's house um, in Craddock Street, uh, a lot of the Christians surrounded me, prayed for me, and after I, they had prayed for me, I received uh, two words, and I said to them, I, I, I can only speak two words in, in tongues, and they said to me, just continue to speak in faith and it will come to you. And I remember that night I was, I was lying awake some portions of the night and then I would say those two words not to forget them. And the next morning when I woke up, I started flowing in, in the Holy Spirit. So I could, so I could, and this is not a theological, I say in the book, this is not a theological defense for the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. That's another book. But what I'm saying is practically how did this help me? As I was coming off the drugs and I had these extreme headaches, I prayed in tongues on my way back from the college to my house and the headaches would lift. Many times when I felt I couldn't carry on anymore, when I felt I actually wanted to maybe go back to drugs or I just felt that um, you know life was getting too tough for me, I would use my prayer language as a weapon. I understood that I was speaking mysteries in the spirit and it was the perfect prayer. So I knew that uh, that God could use that. So speaking in tongues, uh, later on I, I heard theological debates about it. I heard that some pastors even said that it was the devil that's um, enabling you to speak in tongues and stuff like that. Now you see, I can only live my life according to my conviction and according to what God showed me. And let me tell you, in, in, the, in the book of Corinthians, I mean, you can go read the gifts of the Spirit. You can go, go read Paul's explanation of tongues that you know how it works and what it is but i can tell you it's a powerful weapon and, and with the baptism of the holy spirit and the power that i received the joy that i received the touch that i received i also received uh, the gift of speaking in tongues um, that is for every believer and it really helped me so if you're talking about power and and finding god that was one of the aspects that i wanted to highlight in this book in the next section, I will, I will talk about my call to worship, to worship ministry. Um, I will talk about that a bit, uh, but we first have to go for a break. And we're going to say bye to the Facebook Live audience. And we might join with you again in part two, where we are talking about finding God and we are talking about the power of God.